staying neutral in the face of conflict. Many countries decided against taking sides in the Russia-Ukraine war. But what does neutrality mean? And can a nation truly avoid siding with either? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Many countries have decided to avoid taking sides in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 35 nations abstained from voting on a UN resolution condemning the conflict. And Russia's president demanded Ukraine be declared neutral as a condition to ending the war. But the concept of neutrality is under question. The invasion led to Finland and Sweden, that had long been militarily neutral, applying to join the NATO alliance. India is officially not aligned with either Russia or Ukraine, but it has faced criticism for doubling its imports of Russian oil. Even Switzerland, known worldwide for neutrality, is debating its meaning. Media reports say the government vetoed German and Danish requests to supply Swiss-made armored vehicles to Ukraine, as that would violate Switzerland's neutrality. But the country followed much of the West by imposing sanctions and freezing Russian assets in February. The Swiss president said neutrality doesn't mean being indifferent to aggression. Warum? Why did we take this decision? Other democracies must be able to rely on Switzerland. States that stand for international law must be able to rely on Switzerland. And states that uphold human rights must be able to rely on Switzerland. The Federal Council examined the question of neutrality under this light. Playing into the hands of an aggressor is not neutral. All right, let's take a look at what neutrality means. It broadly means not taking sides in armed conflict between warring countries and abstaining from providing military assistance. Countries interpret neutrality differently. For example, Finland and Sweden are more relaxed about their status and describe themselves as non-aligned, whereas neutral countries in Europe are bound by the policies of the European Union. Most countries declare their neutrality, while some are permanently neutral by either constitutional decree or as part of a previous treaty. During hostilities, a neutral state may repeal, change, or modify its position. All right, let's bring in our guests. Joining us on the line from New Delhi, Happy Mohan Jacob, Associate Professor of Diplomacy at Jawaharlal Nehru University and founder of the Council for Strategic and Defense Research. In Zurich, Mark Farha, author and adjunct professor of sociology at the University of Zurich. And in Oslo, Glenn Deason, Professor of International Relations at the University of Southeast Norway. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us on the program today. Mark, let me start with you today. Um, there seems to be some confusion out there when it comes to the concept of neutrality. So I want to take a step back for a moment and ask you about the difference between the law of neutrality versus the politics of neutrality, how those two things differ. That's a tough one. Well, I can speak from a Swiss perspective because Switzerland is obviously known as maybe the first or still the only state maybe in the world that has neutrality enshrined in its very constitution. And that goes back actually a long time. There was a battle in 1516 in Marignano where the Swiss, you know, were trying to overextend themselves and were warriors, still have the Vatican Guard today, if you remember, they're mercenaries. And after that kind of bitter defeat that they had there, they came to the conclusion that that neutrality would be a better option. This was only enshrined really after the Council of Vienna, 1815, the Council of Paris, and then later, as you probably know, the Convention Den Haag, 1907, uh, and so on. But uh, it is something that comes naturally to Switzerland because it's a country kind of perched here in the middle of Europe between contesting powers. You know, taking sides is a costly affair if you bet on the wrong horse or if you're uh, caught in the sort of crosshairs of these uh, contending powers. And that's also why Switzerland then became, of course, the center in the world for diplomacy. And neutrality then is integrally linked to the peace that we've had in Switzerland and the prosperity. And other countries then look to Switzerland as a paradigm. But today, with this new conflict, of course, this is all in danger and uh, questioned again. But the legacy mm -hmm. of it is basically to keep out of these conflicts, to preserve one's own stability, and to act as a platform for diplomacy and 
peaceful conflict mediation. Glenn, was the concept of neutrality interpreted differently in the past, say during the Cold War era or during World War II? Was it interpreted differently in the past than it is today? Well, um, as my colleague suggested, it, it is interpreted in, in different ways. Uh, I guess during the Cold War, it was mostly, uh, it was uh, very much defined as obviously not being part of uh, either of the blocs in order to reduce uh, the tension from this bloc politics. Uh, that's why we saw in Europe during the Cold War, we had this belt of neutral states. Uh, so Finland, Sweden, Austria, Switzerland, which kind of created a, the, a buffer zone. Uh, making Germany the only front line. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we, we linked it more to uh, membership in uh, military alliances. But of course, uh, neutrality also encompasses not taking sides in any armed conflicts, such as providing weapons to one side during a war. Um, but I, I think uh, some of the ideas about uh, neutrality has, has was obscured uh, after the Cold War. It's common to to argue now that neutrality is only over the past three months been, began to collapse, but it began to collapse uh, soon thereafter, after the Cold War, because, uh, um, well, there was an absence of uh, a pan-European security architecture. So we saw that uh, NATO began to take on the role of representing Europe. So NATO expansionism essentially became the main force for what we refer to as European integration. So neutrality effectively then meant to be marginalized from the only security architecture there was on the continent. So uh, it, it, the whole idea of neutrality has changed a lot during the, uh, the post-Cold War era, which is why we also see that it's been collapsing over the past 30 years. Mark, I saw you nodding along to some of what Glenn was saying there, and it looked like you might have wanted to jump in. So go ahead. Well, just a footnote, but I think we all agree, but this is a debate in Switzerland right now because definitionally neutrality meant non-military intervention. And now the question with sanctions is, is that a military intervention or not? Or does that violate the law of neutrality, which is enshrined in the Swiss constitution? The Swiss constitution is not explicit on this. Mm. But military intervention is, is the red line, definitely. Mm. And so delivering weapons to a conflict zone has traditionally been seen as as a you know as something prohibited by the Swiss by Swiss law. Well, Mark, let me follow up with you on that point, because, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, Switzerland essentially is having its neutrality tested somewhat publicly right now. You know, there is this debate over Swiss neutrality. It's been intensifying due to the war in Ukraine. The fact that the Swiss government signed up to the sanctions on Russia, you know, as you mentioned, some viewed that as a sign that Switzerland has abandoned its neutrality. Is this debate in Switzerland going to grow? Are we going to see more lawmakers bringing it up, uh, talking about it. Is, uh, how, how much is the public involved in this debate right now? Well, that's a very good point, because all these decisions were made top down without recourse to the public. And Switzerland is the only direct democracy in the world. It says in the Swiss constitution, the people are the sovereign. So at the end, if there's a referendum, they can overturn any decision made by the federal council. But the federal council unilaterally decided to, in its essence, violate or soften, if you want, the neutrality of Switzerland. Um, I, I would just add a footnote, too, to the Cold War. It's not true that Switzerland was entirely neutral, uh, even before the, during the Cold War. It always was siding, you know, with, with the U.S., in a sense. And uh, also, you remember 1991, uh, Switzerland participated in the uh, sanctions against Iraq. So people forget that maybe a little bit. So it's, there's a precedent there. There has been, as been said by my colleague, certainly a, after the Cold War, certainly a soft thing of, of this whole thing. And Switzerland has a partnership with peace with NATO. So even though it's not a member of NATO, de facto kind of is. So, you know, all the EU is another example. Switzerland decided that people decided to vote against membership in the EU. But the Federal Council opened all kinds of doors to the EU that de facto Switzerland almost became a member of the EU. And the same now with these sanctions here. Now, the, you're right, there is probably, if this continues, and if the Federal Council today or tomorrow decides to deliver you know, munitions to Germany and then to the Ukraine, Denmark, then I think there will be a national referendum or initiative. Now, how that will turn out is another question, mm. because there are some people that are for and against. But I think that we will come to that eventually, because uh, neutrality is something sacred to a lot of Swiss. Maybe not to all, maybe not even to a majority, but to a lot. This was one of the bedrocks of the country. 
Happy month. L let me ask you, India is not officially aligned with either Russia or Ukraine. I want to look for a moment at the difference between neutrality and non-alignment. How is one different from the other? Right. Um, thank you, Mohammed, for asking that question. I think this is uh, often misunderstood uh, by a lot of people uh, globally as to what is India's stance when it comes to some of these issues. As you know, uh, historically, ever since India gained independence in 1947, uh, it has um, claimed uh, itself to be a non-aligned power um, uh, internationally. It has not uh, aligned itself with uh, um, either the Soviet bloc or the U.S.-led bloc during the Cold War years. Uh, except when, of course, um, India was India felt an acute uh, sense of insecurity. So, for example, during the 1971 war between India and Pakistan over Bangladesh, at that point of time, India um, signed a piece of uh, treaty and friendship, friendship with uh, uh, the United uh, the USSR. But for most part of it, India has claimed that it is a non-aligned country. Now, you asked me the difference between uh, non-alignment and neutrality. In the way we see in India. Neutrality means that you don't take a position on any external um, warranties issue. Um, you know, either, either either the two blocks are fighting or two countries are fighting. Um, you have no opinion on that. You you don't take a decision on that. You don't act on uh, act on it. Whereas non-alignment would mean that in general you are not aligned to a country is not aligned to either of the two blocks. Um, but it will continue to have an opinion um, on what is happening. It will continue to take a position or take an action which is in its own national interest, uh, which means you have not neutered the country of its opinion. Uh, what you have done, basically, is that in general, we are not aligned to any two or any of the two blocks or any of the any of the blocks out there. Uh, but we will uh, take a decision on a particular issue based on the merit of uh, the uh, uh, circumstances of it. I think that is a very significant distinction to understand because India is not a neutral power. India, as you know, during um, you know during the period of Jawaharlal Nehru and various other prime ministers, has been pretty active on the global scene, talking about, um, say, for example, decolonization or apartheid um, or or the or the or the ill effects of the Cold War, etc. So it was an active power. At the same time, it was a non-aligned power. So it was not a neutral power. It always had its opinion. It put forward um, uh, solutions. It mediated in the Korean War, in the Korean War, for example. So it was an active power, not a neutral power. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a non-aligned active power, not a neutral, neutral power. Uh, Happy one. Let me also ask you. I mean, India has come under a lot of pressure by countries like the U.S. and other Western countries to try to change its stance uh, when it comes to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, do you think that there's any scenario by which India would actually take a stance against Russia's invasion of Ukraine? I think the um, the thinking in Delhi was that uh, when the war began uh, earlier this year uh, by the Russians in Ukraine, uh, we imagined that this was going to be a quick war. I think much of the international community believed that to be the case. Um, like, for example, the uh, like 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 it happened in 2014. So that assumption has um, you know turned out to be completely erroneous. So if this war persists for a very long time. If this is going to lead to a humanitarian tragedy in Ukraine, I believe you are probably going to look at a lot more pressure on India, both internally and externally, to change its opinion on what's going on. Let me with, let me also sort of caveat uh, you know my argument by saying that it has not really supported the Russian war. Um, say, for example, in 2014, um, India had said that both sides have legitimate interests. Um, India has not made that made that argument in 2022. If you look at India's explanations of what at the United Nations Security Council and the United Nations General Assembly, India has made the argument that it is important to um, honor international law, sovereignty, safeguarding sovereignty is important, external aggression is not a good idea. He has made all those correct argumentation in its explanation. And yet India refused to, um, let's say, vote against Russia or condemn Russia. So, so by not condemning Russia, one could make the argument that India is subtly pro-Russia, right? Now, it is subtly pro-Russia not because it likes what it, Russia is doing, but because of the uh, geopolitical environment mm -hmm. India is located in, which is, you know, you're looking at a very difficult uh, geopolitical environment mm -hmm. where China is actually, um, um, you know, putting pressure on India. So I think to answer your question very quickly, mm -hmm. Mohammed, I think 
um, if this war persists and if this war becomes bloodier, there will be a lot more pressure on India yeah. internally and externally. And I think, I think there will be some rethinking. Uh, Glenn, going forward, will the countries that maintain their neutrality still play an important diplomatic role in finding political solutions to conflict, or do you think that their influence will wane? Well, uh, I, I think their influence will begin to decline because uh, there's hardly any more neutral countries uh, left in Europe. I think uh, um, with if now that Sweden and Finland especially has uh, argued that they will join uh, NATO, I think uh, you will see less and less uh, of this and they will be seen to be participants of the conflict. And by taking sides, there's also less of a diplomatic role they can have, which is why we've seen more of the diplomatic role have, having been shifted towards uh, Turkey. Now, Turkey obviously is a NATO member, but still you see them uh, having more of an independent foreign policy and openly stating, for example, they're not going to join in on all of these sanctions. So I, I think that the, the decline of neutrality will definitely have an impact on, on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on the diplomacy and the ability to promote peace. It also has to be said that I think... Uh, um, I, I think that uh, uh, the, the decline in neutrality is also not just promote, preventing uh, diplomacy, but it's also provoking a lot of uh, conflicts and war. Uh, and I think uh, Finland might, might regret this uh, this decision because keep in mind what, what what happened to Ukraine. I think it's often a common narrative now that uh, Ukraine, if Ukraine had been in NATO, then there wouldn't have been a war. But I think in reality, it was that the U.S. and NATO efforts to end. Uh, Ukrainian neutrality that eventually provoked Russia. Because if we see what the Ukrainian experience was from its independence under President Kuchma, the whole idea was that they should never join NATO without Russia. If they join with Russia, then it would be fine. But without Russia, there would be a front line against Russia that would undermine the neutrality. So they tried to be neutral uh, until the color revolution in 2004, when this was uh, the Western-backed one, which was linked to NATO expansion. Uh, and then relations then again deteriorated until 2010 when Yanukovych was selected and Ukraine uh, again pushed the idea that it was a neutral state. Then things got uh, uh, calm again. And then we saw the toppling of Yanukovych in 2014 with Western support. And this is what then again unraveled uh, the conflict as this was seen to be another effort by NATO to, to rob Ukraine of its neutrality. And um, even the 2015 Minsk agreement that was seen by Russia to a large extent as a way of cementing uh, Ukraine's neutrality. Uh, but unfortunately, it never went anywhere. And uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, definitely the, the decline of neutrality or collapse of neutrality in Europe will continue to make diplomacy more and more difficult and create more uh, areas of conflict. Mark, um, you know, following up on on what Glenn was saying there, um, let me ask you about perceptions of neutrality uh, around the world right now. At a moment like this, uh, does it seem to you that more people are are viewing the concept of neutrality negatively? Well, yes. I mean, I think there was in, in different cases now in, in this Ukraine war, Russia war, which is some way a sibling war, right? If you think about it, uh, between brothers almost. Uh, and the media has, of course, stoked these this haters, Russia phobia everywhere, with tennis players being banned, what have you, which is very uncanny and uh, regrettable, really. Um, I, I do think neutrality has gone out, out of vogue, right, uh, which is very unfortunate, especially for a country like Switzerland. And that's why it's especially, you know, galling to see Switzerland, you know, jump into this so 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 uh, precipitously, and I would say there's a broader crisis here. Frankly speaking, um, you know, neutrality is not something that's even foreign to the United States. If you think about the founding fathers, they were saying we don't want to go abroad for, to search for monsters to destroy, and then over time, America got involved and embroiled in more and more wars. Recently, we know as well, and it became de facto an empire, so to speak. And someone like you know John Mersheimer, the famous realist, warned against that as a realist, saying we shouldn't go you know abroad and become an empire. And we have, as the, I'm a United States citizen as well. And Switzerland now is unfortunately also jumping on this bandwagon to a degree. But I would say both cases in the United States and in Switzerland and other, other cases, these decisions were made, I repeat, top down. It wasn't really a democratic process. There never was really uh, you know, a vote on whether we should go into Iraq or into Libya or into 
other countries, now Ukraine, etc. Mm. A lot of these decisions were taken top down, especially in Switzerland. And I think there will be a populist sort of resentment at some point because there's a huge economic crisis going. We should maybe talk about that, too, because all these countries are going to probably suffer more from the sanctions than Russia is. And that's a very important point to underscore, too, I think, that breaking this neutrality is, yes, it's endangering global peace because diplomacy is no longer on the table mm. and a country like Switzerland will find it difficult to act as a diplomat. But also economically, I think the consequences are very severe and not necessarily positive for anyone, Ukrainian, Russian, European, American civilians. So I think that's important. Uh, Happy Mon, at a time when dialogue and diplomacy uh, oftentimes aren't achieving their aims uh, when it comes to trying to find political solutions to conflicts, different parts of the world. Are institutions like the UN in decline? I think there is uh, absolutely no doubt about the fact that the United Nations is on a terminal decline. We hardly hear of um, the United Nations being able to do anything. Um, anywhere around the world, and it's, it's such a pity. Um, in any case, it, the, the, the one organization that is supposed to safeguard the uh, peace and uh, uh, security of the international system, which is the United Nations Security Council, has become so defunct. Um, in any case, uh, at this point of time, Russia is on the, um, uh, it has always been on the UN Security Council. So um, I think this argument that uh, a lot of us who have been making from the global south, um, um, including India, that the uh, global um, um, or, or international organizations need a fundamental restructuring. Um, the, today's uh, United Nations Security Council or global various other global institutions do not represent the reality of uh, the contemporary international system. These were set up at the at the at the end of the uh, Second World War uh, to suit the uh, victors and their uh, geopolitical uh, aims. Uh, they hold absolutely no value today. So it's, it's unfortunate that we don't have um, any, any, any credible systems or structures in place in order to uh, mediate during crisis or to bring about peace and security. Uh, so I think, um, uh, you know, notwithstanding what happens um, at the end of this war in Ukraine or, or in Russia, there is a serious rethinking that is required by the international community on um, what kind of structures or systems are required. Mm -hmm. For, for keeping peace um, going forward. I think this is something that has been demanded by the, uh, by the powers of the global south. Glenn, there are many countries in Europe that may be rethinking their neutrality right now because of the war in Ukraine. But what about other countries around the world? Are, are a lot of other countries around the world struggling with this as well right now? Well, uh, from my perspective, at least the way I see it, I think it's mainly a European problem. Because uh, yeah, we, we spoke about India, but uh, again, it's um, it's a, it, a, they, they're trying to adapt to a new reality again. When you have countries like India, they see the rise of China, they might be concerned, uh, and therefore seeking closer partnerships with the United States, Japan, and other uh, countries in the region. On the other hand, you also see that the uh, non-aligned countries like India are very apprehensive about not being seen to join an alliance that targets uh, China. So you therefore see a very cautious language that is. Uh, they want to be they, these formations to be pro-Asian and not anti-Chinese, for example. Uh, so, so effectively, not be seen as going against the Chinese. So, so for this reason, I don't think neutrality in Asia, for example, is falling apart uh, in the form of a, a development of an Asian NATO. So, I think again, a lot of this goes back to the whole um, the, the whole well, what's very unique about Europe, which is. Uh, um, that after the Cold War, we had this uh, move first that we were going to have an, uh, a security architecture which wasn't linked to these competing uh, Cold War security uh, military blocks. And uh, and again, I think uh, it, people people don't always appreciate what exactly happened because if we saw in 1999 at the OSCE meeting, now the OSCE was supposed to be like an inclusive security institutions, which uh, which would uh, yeah, reduce the role of uh, these uh, military alliances. Uh, we saw that the Russians, they committed themselves, for example, to withdrawing their peacekeepers from both Moldova and Georgia. However, when they saw that uh, the OSCE would not be some inclusive, uh, uh, impartial uh, security alliance uh, because of NATO expansionism, they saw NATO effectively replacing them. They, they came to the conclusion they couldn't pull out because either they have their troops there or they will join NATO. So having troops in these countries became a tool for kind mm. of imposing neutrality on them. 
and this is uh, this has been kind of the experience over mm. the years in in Europe. All right. Well, we are out of time, so we're going to have to leave the discussion there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Mark Farha, Happy Mon Jacob, and Glenn Deason. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.